This is not a Mother's Day sermon. Um, you know, it didn't even enter my mind to make one for some reason or other. So I said, bad boy, I guess. Uh, but uh, what I, I was looking at the bulletin and uh, the pastor's sermon that he put in here was A Precious Gift. And you know that title actually fits with what we want, I wanted to talk about today. And, um, and so, um, <clears throat> as I was trying to come up with something at the last minute here, as we learned yesterday afternoon, the pastor wouldn't be able to make it. Um, I, I, I thought of, of something that I'd talked about previously, and so went and, and, and looked for, for the information. So let's turn over in our Bibles at this point. That the title of the sermon that I had written down was called The Way of Repentance. And uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. You know, I've got the wrong text. <laughs> Where is it? What's that? Um, what one did I do? Well, you know the ta you know the passage anyway. I can't remember where it's found at the moment. I'm sorry. Uh -huh, it's Second Peter. I'm sorry. Second Peter, chapter three, verse nine. Change that on my note. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, and throughout the Bible record, if you read your Bible from front to back, and you read through the Old Testament, you read through the New Testament, God's messengers and his prophets, the prophets to his people and to the world, were repeatedly calling God's people to repent of their evil deeds. To repent. You know, the Bible says that John the Baptist preached repentance and baptism. And in Matthew 4, verse 17, it talks about Jesus when he came back out of the, out of the wilderness from the 40 days it says, from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus preached repentance because God wants all to come to repentance and be saved. He doesn't want any to perish for lack of repentance. You know, even in the book of Revelation, at the very end, Jesus is calling for his people to repent. So let's turn in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. You're familiar with this one because it's the message to Laodicea. Chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. I would that you were hot or cold. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. The message to the Laodiceans was one of seven sent to seven literal churches in existence at the time that John wrote the book of Revelation. 
However, the messages were also prophetic messages for the churches of the future. Each of the seven churches of Revelation has a corresponding time in history from the early Christian church to the present. And the last church in the list, and the last church in world history, is the church of Laodicea. It is the church that corresponds to our time. It is us. We are Laodicea. And the message to us today is the same one Jesus preached before. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This letter is to us. It's to God's last day church. It's to me. It's to you. And verse 19 says that Jesus loves us. Even after he's just described all of our failures. It says that he loves us enough to do something about it. He rebukes and he chastens. You know, in the past, the phrase, be zealous, therefore, and repent, had in my mind, in my thinking, always been motivated by the rebuking and the chastening. But now I'm not so sure. Now I'm thinking that the fact that Jesus loves us should be the true motivator. Because he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Because Jesus loves us and because of what he has done for us and because of what he is doing for us, we should be zealous and repent. I need to repent. You know, I come to church every week on Sabbath. I stand up here, I teach a lesson, I'm on the church board, I preach occasional sermons, I dress well and I'm respectable. To all appearances, most of you probably think I have little or nothing to repent of. From my perspective, I feel like I'm struggling in isolation because when I look at all of you people, I see people who seem to have their spiritual lives in order, and they don't need to do any repenting either. So I see saints. But if you're like me, we deceive each other, and we hide behind our smiles and our good deeds and our smooth talk. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. And in Luke chapter 13, verse 5, Jesus warned, Except ye repent, ye shall likewise perish. And he was referring to those who were crushed when the, when the tower fell on them. Just as David bemoaned his sinful origin, I also was conceived in sin. And like the Ethiopian, I cannot change what I am. And like the leopard, I cannot change my spots. I am a natural born sinner. And just like Caleb's cocker spaniel, just like that dog is incapable of being sorry that it was born a dog, I am naturally incapable of being sorry that I was born a sinner. Or that I sin. The fact is, I can't be truly sorry. I can't repent. You know, we've all experienced those little fights between our children, and most of us have said or had it said to us, now tell brother you're sorry. <laughs> so the offender says, I'm sorry. But you know and they know he is not really sorry. But he's just saying it. Because he has a certain fearful looking for of judgment if he does not. Unfortunately, I recognize that same attitude in myself all too often. Because I know it is wrong and subject to punishment, I will say I am sorry, but I don't feel sorry. Confession without sorrow for sin and without a change in my life is not true repentance. We see the same situation in a number of Bible characters where they confessed their sins, but they were not truly repentant. Pharaoh in Egypt during the ten plagues, after something terrible had happened, would say, I'm sorry, I repent, I've sinned against the Lord. 
but as soon as the punishment was removed, he went back to the same attitudes and the same behaviors as before. He was not really sorry. He just wanted to avoid the consequence. Balaam, on his way to curse the children of Israel, was nearly killed by an angel of the Lord. But his donkey saw it. And he repented that he had sinned against the Lord. But then, as soon as the sword of the Lord and the angel was gone, he went ahead with his plan. He was not truly sorry. He was just trying to avoid the consequence. The same could go for Achan, who confessed his sin. The same could go for Jesus. I mean, I'm sorry, Judas, who confessed his sin. But they felt no true sorrow over their actions. They only feared the judgment. True repentance requires sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. I need to, and you need to become sorry for our sins. I just can't be truly sorry no matter how hard I try. I just can't make myself do it. I can do nothing to change my condition. But praise God, the situation is not hopeless. I don't have to try to summon up repentance because, why? It's the gift of God. In Acts chapter 5, let's turn over to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 31. Peter and John are called before the tribunal again. We were kind of talking about them in Sabbath school this morning. <clears throat> in verse 31, he's talking about Jesus, and he says, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. I don't have to work at mustering repentance. I can't earn it. I just have to come to Jesus and ask for it, and he gives it freely. But there is a process. You know, in Steps to Christ, page 26 says, The Bible does not teach that the sinner must repent before he can heed the invitation of Christ. He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Matthew 11:28. It is the virtue that goes forth from Christ that leads to genuine repentance. Peter made the matter clear in his statement to the Israelites when he said, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. We can no more repent without the Spirit of Christ to awaken the conscience than we can be pardoned without Christ. Close quote for Steps to Christ there. Even though repentance is a gift, we must still receive it and accept it. So we need to learn how to do that. How does God give us the repentance we so desperately need? Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. He also asks in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Not only is repentance a gift of God, but he also leads us to repentance. Clearly there is something about the goodness of God that gives godly sorrow, which in turn leads to repentance. True repentance, true sorrow for sin, is associated with God's forbearance and God's long-suffering. You know, in Matthew chapter 18, let's turn over there and take a look. Matthew chapter 18, Peter comes to Jesus. Verse 21. Peter came to Jesus and he said, Lord, 
how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? From what we hear, the Pharisaical standard was three. Peter was going way above and beyond the requirements of the Pharisees in his generosity and being willing to extend forgiveness seven times. And in verse 22, Jesus said to him, I say, unto, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. You know, this story has always been kind of a simple story to me with a straightforward purpose. And as is so often with the case, the case with Bible study, there is usually much more than meets the eye. I've always understood this story to illustrate that we should always be willing to forgive our brothers repeatedly. Jesus' response was not just to instruct his followers on how they are to treat one another. It was to illustrate and to reveal the willingness of God to forgive. Over and over and over again. Until all possibility of keeping count is lost. God doesn't ask us to do more than he is willing to do himself. You know, and by using that figure 70 times 7, Jesus was clearly referring to another 490 in Scripture. He was calling to mind that 70-week prophecy of Daniel in which 70 weeks, or 490 years, were set aside as a probationary time for Israel to come to repentance. He was willing to forgive until his people refused to accept it any longer until his forgiveness could no longer inspire any response of contrition in them, until they actively rejected his forgiveness. Now, and since Hannah isn't here, I'm going to use her in an illustration. <laughs> Suppose we were all down here at the church, at Church Work B, and it's crowded in the foyer, and as I go to get a drink at the fountain, I step on her toes. When she squawks, I say, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. Later, while passing in the hallway, I step on the same toes again. Her yelp of pain brings instant apologies from me as she hobbles off. A third time, I step on the toes again. A third time, I apologize. The fourth time, I step on her toes. Her angry response goes something like, knock it off, John. If you do that again, I'm going to punch you in the nose. And I can hear, Sam, I can hear Hannah saying that. But I say, I'm really, really sorry. To which she replies, if you were really sorry, you would watch where you're going and stop stepping on me. And say, we didn't even get to seven. The same times of forgiveness that Peter proposed. But God's forgiveness extends beyond seven times. And no matter how many times we step on his toes, he will forgive. That is good news. If I unintentionally offend someone, I expect to be forgiven. After all, I didn't mean to do it, but after the seventh time, or even the fourth time, I can no longer expect anything. All I can expect is an angry rejection. It is nothing but pure mercy and grace if I continue to receive forgiveness after four times, after seven times, after 270 times, up to 490 times. Only mercy and grace. And that is what God offers. Undeserved, unearned forgiveness over and over and over again. This is the goodness of God. This is his long suffering. This is his forbearance, which the scripture tells us leads us to love him. How can we not love him when he keeps showing us such mercy and such forgiveness? The godly sorrow that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10 results 
from our grateful and loving response to God's infinite willingness to love us and forgive us. There are tales told about the training of royal children, and you've probably heard them. The king would assign a commoner to play with and to study with the royal heir. They would become friends. Yet when the heir misbehaved or failed to learn his lessons, it was forbidden to punish him so the schoolmaster would punish the commoner in the place of the heir. He would receive the whipping that was due to the heir. He was the designated whipping boy. Now think of someone you love, someone close, a friend, and suppose that every time you sin, a big man with a stick representing the law came and instead of punishing you, he beat your loved one until they were bruised and bloody at your feet. How many times do you think you would repeat that sin? Would you want to stop that sin? Certainly. You would want to stop the suffering of the one you love. And Jesus has become our whipping boy. Jesus has volunteered to take the beating for us. He did take the beating for us. Isaiah 53 verse 5 tells us that. It's the great famous chapter on the Lamb of God. It says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or punishment for our peace was put upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. He not only took our beating, but he took our death as well. When we see the suffering of Jesus because of our selfishness and sin, how can we help but be moved to sorrow for our sin? Not because we fear the punishment, as did Judas and Achan and Balaam, but because we love him. Because we love him out of gratitude for what he's done. Do we love Jesus enough to want to stop sinning? Do we love him enough that we feel sorrow for the suffering and humiliation he endured and continues to endure for us? If we love Jesus, we won't want to sin because it hurts him when we do. And if we do sin, we are truly sorry, truly repentant, because we know the pain it causes him. Rather than sorrow induced by fear of punishment, we experience then godly sorrow. The solution to receiving repentance then is not in trying to be sorry for our sins, but in how we respond to the long suffering and the forbearance and the forgiveness of Jesus. If Jesus is the center and focus and love of our lives, we will have true repentance, true sorrow for sin. It is the gift of God that comes to us when we study and meditate on the self-sacrificing love that Jesus showed us when he volunteered to bear our punishments. When we think of him and talk with him and invite him into our homes and hearts, his very presence there creates the godly sorrow for sin that is repentance. In short, repentance equals relationship. The relationship creates repentance. Jesus explained many times that all righteous characteristics result from the abiding relationship where we abide in him and he in us. And he said, without me, you can do nothing. We can't even repent. Yet with Jesus, I can do all things because he strengthens me. That's the promise. I can repent with Jesus. In Luke chapter 12, verse 27, Jesus said, Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not. They spin not. And yet I say to you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. What did the lilies do? They merely received from God the gifts of sun, water, and nutrients. When they received these things, they automatically utilized them to produce what we see. The result was raiment of incomparable beauty. From Steps to Christ again, page 68. The plants and flowers grow not by their own care or anxiety or effort, but by receiving that which God has furnished to minister to their life. The child cannot, 
by any anxiety or power of its own add to its stature. No more can you, by anxiety or effort of yourself, secure spiritual growth. The plant, the child, grows by receiving from its surroundings that which ministers to its life, air, sunshine, and food. What these gifts of nature are to animal and plant, such is Christ to those who trust in him. The next page, our growth in grace, our joy, our usefulness, all depend upon our union with Christ. It is by communion with him, daily, hourly, by abiding in him that we are to grow in grace. He is not only the author, but the finisher of our faith. It is Christ first and last and always. He is to be with us, not only at the be beginning and the end of our course, but at every step of the way. David says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Psalm 16, verse 8. So if we go back to, now to our passage in Revelation chapter 3, the message to Laodicea. The call to Laodicea is to be zealous and repent. As members of Laodicea, of what do we need to repent? Do we need to repent for being wretched and miserable <clears throat> and poor and blind and naked? No. These are natural conditions that are not our fault. The problem is that we don't see that this is our condition. Until we can see our condition, we cannot repent. And why don't we see our condition? Where is Jesus in this message? In this message to the church at Laodicea? Verse 20. Where is he? He's outside the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, he says. He's knocking to get inside. And what does he promise will happen if he is allowed in? If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. He will eat with us if he is allowed in. He who is the bread of life, he who is the water of life, he who is the word of life and the light of life. When the door opens and our eyes behold him, when we see him, then we see how impoverished we are compared to him and we see what great love he has for us. Here we have the king of the universe stooping to share his time, his food, his raiment, his life, his kingdom with us. In old times, it was a great privilege and the highlight of a person's life if somebody from royalty even acknowledged you. If they even said a word to you. But here we have the king of the universe who wants to come and wants to dwell with us. All the failings of Laodicea are supplied and remedied by the entry of Jesus into our hearts. He even gives us the repentance we need to overcome our sins when we let him into our hearts. We need to come to Jesus. We need to invite him into our hearts and when we do he will give us all those good gifts, all those good gifts of grace, the gold tried in the fire, the righteousness and the raiment, the eye salve, and repentance. For us to have sorrow for sin and to have victory over it, we must know Jesus. We must keep our attention focused on him. Steps of Christ, page 88, says, If you would become acquainted with the Savior, study the Holy Scriptures. Are we reading our Bibles? The way to receive this gift of repentance is to daily seek Jesus, and this can only be done through the reading of the word and daily conversation with him. 
don't leave him standing outside your door. He is the one who was beaten bloody for you. He is the one who went to your execution for you. He is the one who gave everything he had for you. Don't be so ungrateful that you won't even let him into your home and your heart. Invite him in and receive from him true repentance inspired by gratitude for what he has done for you. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the sins of Laodicea, my sins and your sins. Be zealous therefore because of the great love that he has shown for you. Open the door. See his scars of love and repent. Let's bow our heads. Father, this is a hard thing for us who are so proud. When we see Jesus, when we see his love for us, when we realize how much we have lost, our hearts overflow with gratitude. Thank you, Lord, that you have revealed to us your great gift of salvation. That you have taken our cares, our burdens, our sins, and our punishment for us. And in their place, you want to give us all heaven and eternity. That you want to have us as your friends forever. Lord, forgive us now for our neglect and our ingratitude. Lord, help us to develop daily that relationship with Jesus. Fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit now. Convict us of our sin and reveal to us the heart of Jesus, how much he loves, how much he has given so that our hearts will be filled and thrilled with gratitude and love for such great gifts as he has given to us. When we receive those gifts and we recognize your love, may our hearts be stirred. May we then see that our friend, our Savior, suffers because of our choices. Bring to our hearts and our minds this vision of Jesus standing at the door waiting to come in because he wants to save us. Lord, help us to let him do that. Today we want to invite Jesus into our hearts. Give us true repentance, a true sorrow for sin that makes it hateful because of what it does to Jesus, not because of a fear for the earned consequence. Lord, we see Jesus bruised and bleeding for us. A love we cannot comprehend. Now fill our hearts with that response is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.